a big welcome to everybody um, on the call today. Uh, you, uh, today's session is going to be managing trust in the virtual organisations um, and it's based upon our research and um, the Advanced Workplace Institute's research on managing the virtual workforce. So um, if you're wondering who the Advanced Workplace Institute is, who are these people that have emailed you, uh, that, is, um, that is this community of people. We are um, a supported community and uh, we are a group of leaders that aspire to change the world of work and our members are usually from uh, an HR, an FM, IT and CRE background and we provide a range of support tools including scientific research and workshops. This is kind of a mini example of one of those uh, and we're an intimate peer-to-peer -peer community. Um, on the screen you can see a collection of some of our members. So in today's session we're going to be uh, uh, having a panel discussion and it's led by Andrew Mawson. Uh, so where we're going to be looking at trust in virtual teams and organizations before sharing with you the ways in which you can continue to engage with the Advanced Workplace Institute. So on our panel today, just to briefly introduce them, we have Andrew Mawson, one of the founders of Advanced Workplace Associates, a global virtual consultancy. Karen Plum, um, Director of Research and Development at Advanced Workplace Associates. And last but by no means least, um, Peter Haig, uh, Global Chief Executive Officer at Mintel and supporter of Manchester United, as you'll be well aware of if you were here a few minutes early before we started. <laughs> um, as we go through, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat fun function, chat function of Zoom. Um, and I'll try and throw them in as we are going through. So I'd just like to invite Andrew um, to come onto the mic now and start yeah. our panel discussion. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, Peter, hello. Thanks very much for coming and uh, spending your time with us today. The big question I think we're going to discuss today is whether United should hang on to Paul Pogba. That's what that we'll be dealing with. <laughs> later on in the in the session <laughs> separate I'll discussion on that one then, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um without further ado i mean it'd be great peter if you could tell us mintel is one of those names that everybody hears some sometime on the radio or you know through some of the research you've done uh, around the consumer world mostly um do you want to just tell us a little bit about you, who you are and where you are and what you yeah sure sure um first time i came across mintel i was watching it slide out of my university library window somebody was stealing a copy of one of the reports and it they just sort of put it out of this fan light window and they were, had a mate underneath the, the library ready to catch the report so obviously we do reports so we're a people business there's about 1200 of us in 15 offices around the world um, we're a British company and we've got 5,000 clients and what we do is we help people grow, companies grow, um, by offering um, expertise in what consumers want and why. What does that mean? We help people pro uh, develop new products, mainly in the consumer packaged goods space, um, and we help them understand what the latest consumer trends are and develop marketing strategies, pricing, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Recently, just as an example, we're helping um, a lot of our beauty companies um, try and take advantage of um, mask wearing and um, how they need to develop cosmetics to um, deal with it. And uh, apparently, according to our research, the beard trend has gone. Um, beards are going to be no more once people have to wear these masks because it's a bit itchy, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Not being a beard wearer. No doubt Lewis will show us uh, shortly him wearing the AWA mask that we've had specially prepared for our associate community. Anyway, that's another story. Peter, how did you end up in Mintel? What's your background? Are you, which, which discipline did you start out in? And an ad guy. Um, worked in a couple of London ad agencies um, until about, God, 24 years ago now. <laughs> and uh, joined as, as marketing director and then... Um, somehow fuddled my way through to global <laughs> chief exec. <laughs> so uh, how long have you been at Mintel now then, Peter? 24 years, um, yeah. different roles. Um, right. We, uh, the trick of the trade has been um, globalizing. So yeah. we've, we've invented some good products, um, targeting a sort of community that I understand quite well, uh, marketing people. And so um, I've been lucky enough to be able to to um, spend time talking to a lot of people that I like, have common interests, because I, I, I do like the marketing world. Um, and um, it's worth working out what works in, in the UK, then worked in America, 
guys in New York and, and Chicago tend to like what we do. And they're moving that out to Shanghai and so on and so forth around the world. And uh, it's re yeah. worked reasonably well. Yeah, well, you've seen, so you've seen a lot of growth during that period, of course, and, uh, yeah. and that globalization. Yeah, it must have been a fascinating time looking back on the, on the journey, as it were. Yes, yeah, it's fun. Um, 70 people when I started, uh, 1,200 now, just to touch under 1,200. Right. Um, turnover of 3 million to about 120. So we're sort of a medium-sized company with a global yeah. footprint. Yeah. So we're sort of yeah. punching above our weight in some ways. So yeah. we're doing a lot of these things for the first time. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the thing that I find quite fascinating about some of the work you've done is, is where you, in the past you've been you know basically um buying products and you know taking them apart and photographing them and then providing those as um reports and things associated with clients so that you know they see what other organizations are doing that's quite an interesting yeah so we have um a network of field associates in 250 countries and um they go shopping for us and buy products cpg products and we um we analyze those products which means taking all the data off the packaging and sticking it onto a database. And we do the same thing with direct mail, email, um, TV adverts, all in the States, really to be able to look at data and then um, analyze it using some clever algorithms and forecasting models to be able to sort of give a direction of travel and, yeah. and be able to target people better. We're, we're essentially there to help people sell more stuff. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. A, a simplistic way of looking at it and so it seems to do a reasonable job. That's your strap line. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 I mean, let's talk about trust because that's that's why we're we're kind of here. I mean, trust is an important topic because it, you know, it came out very strongly in our research as being one of the things that has potential to be under pressure when, you know, organisations are working virtually. Um, I mean, how would you? And, and you know, trust seems to have a you know numerous dimensions. How would you describe? trust you think what's your what would your definition of trust be mm. um well honesty and belief in um people right. and i don't think it's i think it sort of operates both ways vertically so trust of people above you and trust of people below you but having that honest relationship um where you're straightforward people particularly uh, with people particularly in an environment like this um keep them well informed communication you know i'm probably going to use that word almost as much as trust in this conversation this afternoon it's you know communication is critical and under a lot of pressure at the moment yeah interesting interesting so karen from a sort of um a sort of an academic perspective from the report what what did the um what did seba describe as as trust what was the definition from the academic it, world it's about um, the, uh, the judgment or the, our expectations about whether the actions of other people will be to our benefit or, or certainly not to our uh, to our detriment. And what they found was that they're both it, it's a both a head thing and a heart thing. So our heads will be looking for uh, feedback in terms of the competence of of other people, um, and our hearts are are really taking a view as to how we feel emotionally about whether we can. Um, trust somebody so there are those two uh, components to be thought about mm. so that, that, that kind of links to to honesty in a way doesn't it because it, honesty in a sense is is a belief that somebody is you know is, is is doing things which is which are authentic and which are in in your interest to some to some degree or if, or if they're not in your interest at least they're being open about mm. that um so in in the um in the uh, recent past, Peter, I mean, if you, you know, you've, I know you've, uh, you've necessarily, like many organisations, you've moved to a, a virtualized model um, with people working at home. I mean, how have you found the management of trust during that period? I mean, how, has trust held up and in, and in what dimension would you say? Um, yes, yeah, it's, we've, we've been trading essentially, um, the answer is yes, it has held up but we've been trading very much on those long established relationships we've had face to face over a lot of years and it's, yeah. it dissipates, um, particularly when there's challenges. Um, so the natural go-to are the people that you've worked with for a few years or, or 
the longer the better to ask questions when everybody's nervous there's a lot of change going going on in in our organization a lot of planning going on and you, you tend to um, just instinctively go to those people that you know well and have, have performed well in the past um, but um, where we've we've built trust through this period is is over communicating so previously we had um, company presentations once a quarter um, and they were done uh, in a face-to-face -face environment um, around the different regions um, some people did dial in but where possible we'd do them face to face so people could ask live um, questions and answers and we've moved that to every two weeks yeah. um, and it's it's a bit of a hamster wheel to be honest you, you're yeah. sort of finishing one company presentation giving all the information then give yourself 24 hours breather and then you've got to figure out what the content for the next one will be um, but we've done uh, lots of research with our staff whilst they've been locked down to check they're okay and see how they're going and we scored really well on on communication um, with the exception of um, when we were slow with Black Lives Matter um, in the States because that was a much bigger issue um, than um, one might appreciate it's certainly in, in other places it was it was huge there for a whole employee base and understandably so um, and what we did was um, we decided to talk to some people first before we went live with our communication and that took us three or four days and that wasn't fast enough people were expecting responses in 24 or 48 mm. hours of what our position was um, and so we got um, you know some some upset employees that we weren't moving fast enough now we've um, we've done our best to um, rebuild that trust but it's taken a lot of work so big learning there is um, mm. communicate um, and if you lose trust it's very hard to rebuild was that was that because the vacuum in communication led people to believe that you were sympath not sympathetic to that cause is that what what happened um yes they just expected from a, an organization which which takes a stance on lots of things because we're yeah. you know we're, we're a, um we have a view on consumers attitudes every day of our lives and for us to be silent for three or four days was was unusual totally and we were just trying to make sure it was the right thing we we're actually talking to a lot of our yeah. um our, our black employees in the states to see you know how we should yeah. deliver things and talk yeah. about things yeah. um but obviously that didn't come across to people oh. um because when there's a vacuum yeah isn't it yeah yeah, you you were doing that stuff in the background, but nobody could, could yeah. see it apart from the people that were directly involved. involved. Mm, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, this links back a little bit to the honesty thing. I mean, to what degree do you think? I mean, you've been able to talk pretty much to the whole of your workforce through through this period, haven't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. It was one to one to one. You know, one one to many, uh, but from the individual standpoint, it's one to one almost. So they can sort of see your expression. They can hear the the, the intonation. You know, there's a lot of information that's passing between you directly and, and each individual yeah. and that you know to what degree do you think that plays into that sense of of honesty you know you can look you in the eye and uh, you know well he said that actually and, I, and do i believe him sort of thing is yeah it, yeah interesting isn't it around, around that? it is you've um you can control the message in some ways you can practice your lines you can um, have run-throughs with people but in some ways that's disingenuous you should be yourself and just mm -hmm. have your personality if you're sad about something look sad um, but you know as a chief executive you have to be sort of quite bouncy and positive so generally that isn't the case but you know when you are concerned um, you have to be honest and say look here's our plan to put it right yeah. um, and it helps you can get your message to more people more quickly and more consistently but you can't get that temperature check um, when you leave the you know presentation to go around and say hey Susan how did that go that? what you know how did that come across yeah, yeah and yeah, people yeah. aren't as willing to um, chat and say hi it's 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 Billy from America and you know I'm, I'm a bit worried about what you just said there they won't do that they tend to stay silent yeah yeah, there are pros and cons in the whole thing, aren't there? Mm. Yeah. I mean, just to talk, talk about a slightly different dimension of trust. Um, you know, it seems to me that you and you've mentioned it before. There are all, there are people in all organisations who, who t people do tend to trust. Um, yes. And there are people who they tend to trust less. 
why do you think that is? What's, what, what leads to that high level of trust in some people, but not in others, do you think? Positive experience in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can be having given them some information that's, you know, they've, that's confidential and they've kept it confidential, mm -hmm. or they, they've supported you in something. Um, that's, I think, very important. And I think a natural openness is important. And being yourself, one of the things that that I've certainly learned in leadership is to to be yourself. You know, you, you, everybody has this cookie cutter impression of how a leader should be. Mm. And certainly as, as um, social media changes people's attitudes and make people much more accessible as leaders, mm. um, it's, it's very short sighted to try and pretend to be something you're not. Mm. Um, it's much better to be yourself warts and all um, yeah. and show your character and talk about Manchester United and, <laughs> you know, just be natural. Um, and it, I don't know, From my point of view, it seems to work. <laughs> but, well, but I think you've built a culture like that, Peter, is my, is my sense. Um, you know, some, some, some chief execs are not so comfortable you know, to, to, to speak in this open way. I mean, there's a, you know, in some companies that, you know, we, we work with that openness just isn't there. They do, everybody's protecting the, the messaging and worrying about mm. how you uh, present things all the time and, and, and all that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. I think it comes back to this, things back to honesty and authenticity mm. as a cultural trait. And I think often that does come from the, the leader of the business. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I think being reliable and keeping your personality pretty similar. If you're a bullion and bouncy, yeah. um, you need to be consistent. And I've noticed that people um, with with different leaders in our organisation, if their personality changes, mm. you know, when they're normally bouncy and they're they're a little bit quieter, mm. people really can worry and and panic mm. about that. So they want reliability. They also want competence. Mm -hmm. um, you know they trust you as far as the results are good mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're having an enjoyable ride mm -hmm. um, and so it's under a lot of pressure at the moment you know our, our results are um, uh, more than adequate at the moment we're doing quite well um, not as well as we were but um, certainly compared to the most um, but where there are difficulties, they want to be able to see a clear, clearly articulated plan. Um, I think that's that's really important if people can trust you to produce a, a very simple um, mm. and logical plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because there's so much changing about how we operate. I mean, look at what's happening here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's different. Yes. Um, yeah. Indeed. So there's so much change. People want reliability and they want people to be good at their jobs. Yeah. Uh, and that builds trust. So, that, so, so it links back a little bit to the issue of co competence, you know, trust. I think competence has for me two dimensions, which are often confused. One is the, the belief that you'll act in, in the interest of the, you know, the colleague or the company. Um, and that means when you're not in their eyesight, as it were. And the second part of it is about competence. You know, will, can I rely on what they give me? Can I rely on them to, you know, to do what it is that the, we want them to do? Uh, and I, I think those two components, because, you know, if you go back long enough, uh, people, when we were talking to people a few years ago about working away and working virtually and all this sort of stuff, many people would say, well, our leaders just don't trust people. And, you know, and I got to thinking about that and, and trying to understand what that really meant. And it did, in the end, it seemed to me that it was, it was, it was confused. It was about, partly about competence. It was partly about a belief that they would swing the lead in some way mm. uh, if, if, you know, if they weren't there. Um, but Karen, how does the research link to that idea? I mean, does, does the, the idea of competence come in? Definitely. Um, as I said uh, earlier, you know, that it's that uh, it is the competence and the emotional. Um, it, it, there are those two components. And if you're if you're if you operate from a position of my gut feeling, mm. 
you know that's the emotional um, aspect of you deciding whether somebody is is um, trustworthy whereas you should be also asking yourself as you've just been speaking about you know is, is this a competence thing do I trust the information that this person is providing me with um, or do I think that I might put myself into a vulnerable position and there's also a, a degree to which there is a, a thing that research, the researchers call propensity to trust so some people have a natural default state of I will trust you until you you know show me a good reason why I shouldn't and I think that you know to, to Peter's point about what makes somebody trustworthy in an organization I think if they are also so sending out those signals that they trust you you know that's likely to be repaid yeah that's an, that's interesting isn't it? so so in in terms of the you know if, if you said before Peter I think interestingly that you know under these circumstances you know trust has come under pressure um what are the things that people need to do in order to be trusted you know if you if you thought about all the people who you imagine you know that you you in your own mind you sort of say well like those are trustworthy people i would rely on them mm -hmm. what do the others have to do to get up to that state um work ethic um and a can-do attitude mm -hmm. um, is important um, and delivering superior results is very right. important i everybody at the moment um chairman down they're under pressure and they're a little bit worried you know mm. things are changing and nobody really knows what tomorrow's going to bring um, and so they'll go to people that have delivered results in the past there mm. sort of go to four or five people yeah. Um, I think the other thing is identifying with each other and it sort of plays very much into um, relationships. We all try to do that to an extent over VC now talking about Manchester United and football and, and things we have in common. And, um, Karen and I were talking about cats before we started. Mm. You, know, you try and do that naturally, but it's so much easier face to face. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's a, so it, it's a, it's a, it, you know it's a it's a complex thing this isn't it and if you it seems to me you have to create the conditions under which you are trusted but I think the other thing that I would say is that, you know people need to deliver on their promises mm. I think and the problem I think we have is that in the in the you know in the old romantic world of offices where we're all together there was a lot of information flowing to us all the time and we could you know we almost didn't have to trust people. Whereas now we're only seeing snippets of their, their time. And so we, in a sense, we're having to give them the benefit of the doubt based upon what we know of them and what we, we believe of them. So it's, 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 not an easy, uh, it's not an easy thing. And as Karen, you were saying, I mean, some leaders are very good at this, but what about the ones that aren't? I mean, you know, we can't just uh, discard people in the new virtual world uh, who can't quite um, get there. Is this a trainable thing, do you think? I think there's a lot of awareness that, that you can help people to, to, to come to. I mean, Pete was talking about knowing people well. And mm -hmm. if you know somebody well, it helps you to, to set the expectation that you have of them. So, and, and perhaps that m means that the expectations won't be unreasonable. And we should also bear in mind that we're all subject to a, a, a dizzying array of biases. And so, you know, trying to being aware um, that, that we might be subject to a, a particular bias about a, a certain person, particularly in the absence of, of more contextual information about them, could lead us to draw very erroneous conclusions. And I think, you know, it's, um, it, it's about making people more aware, encouraging them to gather more evidence before they make a decision about whether somebody is trustworthy or not. So you almost like it seems to me you almost have a trust index, don't you? Almost stamped on your forehead, um, and uh, I guess depending on who you uh, who you are and what you've done, that trust is seen by different people who perhaps have had different experiences of you as well. So yeah, there's... and I think you know to to Peter's earlier point, I mean it you know this builds up over time. You know, mm -hmm. much within um, between you and your manager or you and your team, it's also you and the organisation. How has the organisation treated me over the years? Has it mm -hmm. generally told me the truth? Do I trust it to look after me as an employee, or is that you know am I worried that the, the you know the the undertow of this announcement that somebody is making is actually 
literally the precursor to me being made redundant. Mm -hmm. And well, they lied to me last time because, you know, things were going pear shaped and they didn't tell. So, you know, people remember that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, indeed. One question that's come through from um, Nick um, is he says he wholly agrees on comms, but to what extent do you need to walk the talk, read trust? Can we have a more sophisticated comms plan and program, but that could be undermined by the day to day behaviours that contradict those nice words, those fine words? So, how do you ensure that your leaders walk the talk? Peter? Um, I think. <laughs> resting control in some ways managing the outputs rather than the inputs so i've i've seen people when when we first started doing flexible working um where people could work one or two days a week at home um about seven years ago the go-to certainly my go-to was fine okay right we'll expect them to be at their desks at nine o'clock and what should we give them half an hour for lunch and that was the instinctive thing to do which was entirely wrong it's managing the outputs. Look, we trust you to do your work. Um, we want you to produce this work product of a certain quality by the end of the month. And we're going to help you to do that. And that's a, that's a paradigm shift in, in a, an emotional position mm. from a, a leader. Mm. And so I always worry when people talk about process. Um, I think you need to clearly define the outputs that you're looking for and try to stay away from the process because one of the benefits of, of this new shift is that people have more flexibility. So if they want to go and drop junior off at school or take the cat to the vets, that's brilliant. And you should, you know, celebrate that if it's at 11 o'clock in the morning vet trip, you know, great. And you should be open and honest about saying, can't do it at 11 o'clock. I'm going to the vets. Um, rather than managing an overall process. Um, I think with in more detail about communication, um, yes, have the messages, yes, um, make them genuine, open and honest, good and bad sides of them, but here's what we're trying to do to um, solve the bad side or, or soothe the bad side, but then follow up with smaller groups. So what we've been trying to do is talk to the company Mm. and then talk to the sales team in China and the American team, you know, small groups of them to explain what you mean and, you know, literally having an open agenda. So, you know, we've talked about all these things. What questions have you got? Anything, you know, what are you worried about? You worry about redundancies, you worry about that. Actually force the difficult questions because you know they're there. Mm. Yeah. No, I think that's really, really important. And, you know, I think the, in a sense, you know, that dialogue is much better than sending out uh, you know corporate communications and things because i think you know, there's an awful lot of stuff that gets missed out on those really and people can make their own interpretation and it's easy to lose a bit of trust now listen we're we're a little bit uh, tight on time now we've got another minute but peter you i know you're you know you're you're heading in the direction of virtual working as an organization going forward it's quite clear that you know based on this conversation trust is a really important thing to um, to protect so uh, and it's not an easy thing and, and as you said before it's it's easily well, it's, it's a tough thing to win even mm -hmm. as an individual but it's very easy to lose so it seems to me that in the world that we're heading towards we have to take responsibility for our trust worthiness uh, in a way that maybe we didn't have to think about quite so much before um, so, look, so, so on that note, Peter, thank you ever so much for giving over your time. I know you squeezed us in between a couple of important meetings, so it's very kind of you. Um, and we're very impressed with the fact that you've taken your Mintel office and put it in your home environment as well. <laughs> and, uh, to thank the marketing team for that. <laughs> so thank you for that. So, and thanks, Karen, for your contribution as well. Yeah, Lewis, yeah. over to you to round up. Fantastic. So I'll just take one minute to... Um, uh, to, to round us up here. Uh, so yes, if you're interested in the research, um, which we've, we've talked about, the uh, management summary of the report will be emailed out to you. There is a link for that. Um, so AWI members though, you do currently have access to the full report um, in addition to that management summary as well. So for those of you who would like to know how to continue to engage with um, the AWI community and are looking to uh, be part of that community which are wanting to improve the world of work, then AWI annual membership
membership is a serious consideration for you. So we do have a current uh, discount on that membership, which will be in a follow-up email I'll send to you within the next 24 hours, along with information about the AWI's range of support for organizations and for teams as well. So if you found the research to be of interest and you would like to give others in your organization a chance to engage with this in a slightly more in-depth way, in a gamified way, then we're offering you an in-house managing the virtual workforce leaders workshop, um, which will be detailed in this follow-up email too. And if you'd like to know how your teams are performing in relation to the six factors highlighted by the report, then we would like to invite you to participate in the AWI Virtual Workforce Performance Index, which is an online survey which will help you to facilitate that too. And for those of you who are interested in further knowledge around this topic of virtual working, we have our final session of this series, which is going to be on the 7th of September. Um, and I'll be emailing you a link to register for that event. Um, if you haven't already, I know some of you are very keen, you're loving the content we're putting out there uh, during these sessions. So you've already registered um, ahead of time. So that all that is left for me to, to do is to say a massive thank you to our panelists, to Peter, to Andrew and to Karen. Uh, a thank you to all of you in attendance. I hope you have enjoyed and learned something today. And I would ask that any feedback you have that you place into the chat function here on Zoom. So if you would like any further information on engaging with us, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for your time and goodbye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. <laughs>